Welcome to SmokehouseStudios.net. The in-studio broadcast feed is now live. Warning. This show is about the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you are easily offended by the truth, then you need to keep listening. His return is drawing near. Smokehousestudios.net The Front Porch Show A unique blend of current events and what they might mean. Humbly seen through the eyes of God's Word, the Bible, in an old school front porch discussion with occasional guests, your input, and a guiding hand through Christ. Broadcasting from atop the front porch, it's SmokehouseStudios.net's The Front Porch Show. Now, carefully blending more smoke goodness in each and every soundbite, your host, Smokehouse. Hey, hello, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, friends, wherever you may be across the globe, across the United States. Oh, Smokehouse with you here, Smokehouse Studios.net, Front Porch Show. Out here on this Saturday night, March 20th, 2021. Well, as we always do, we have a jam-packed program for you tonight. I have to be honest with you, I was unsure if uh, we were going to be able to pull one off this evening because my travel agent has uh, informed me Friday that uh, my vacation spot for Monday morning uh, is going to be out into the Carolina mountains, which means I have to leave Sunday, tomorrow. So I got in late last night, and I was like, oh, man, I don't know. But we got uh, we got it done. Praise God. Uh, we don't want to deny God. You know, at any cost, we don't deny God. If it, if it comes down to doing something for yourself or doing the program, you better do the program because God will get you. <laughs> God will get you. The title of tonight's program is titled... Test of faith. Test of faith, folks. The things that have happened this week is going to test not only our faith as Christians, but our faith as Americans. Because only a divine intervention is going to be able to divert what is coming. We have a new gun bill that has been proposed by Dianne Feinstein that has passed the House and going to the Senate. So we have uh, gun bill, HR, what is it? Uh, well, we'll cover all the gun bills uh, at that time. Uh, two draconian gun bills. Uh, Diane Feinstein wants to ban uh, anything that would be considered an assault weapon, which is going to be pretty much uh, everything. And then we have the Federal Registry of All Firearms going to the Senate as well. So both of these bills, now the hardcore draconian H.R. 127 bill, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think it has uh, been voted on in the House, H.R. 127. Let's look it up here real quick. That is the one that's going to, uh, no. Okay, the draconian H.R. 127 uh, hasn't been sent to the House yet. It's just been introduced. So, okay. Whew. But the other two, they may not need to pass H.R. 127 because these two combined that are already now past the House going into the Senate may do what H.R. 127 will do. Now, they, we know that they create the problem and then they come out with the solution, okay? We saw it with the COVID. They needed to win the election. They created a virus, man-made in a, in a laboratory, been proven, just so they can come with the solution with, okay, we have to lock everybody down, churches. You can't do this, can't do that. Uh, now we have to have mail-in voting. And that's what they did to steal the election. So with this gun bill now, there's been a, a, uh, a mass shooting down in Georgia which we're going to cover in a little bit. But this gentleman now has shot up a bunch of Asians. And now the media is running with this narrative that 
because Trump was calling the coronavirus the China virus, now it's causing the domestic terrorists, the Trump supporters, to go after the Asian descent. So they're using this as a narrative to push their gun control laws. So we'll cover all of that as well. So see, you understand why we are in a test of faith. Now, I was uh, putting the show together this afternoon, and I, I stumbled across something that um, is going to be a surprise for you. I'm going to share it at break time. Uh, Y'all will be privy to something new that's in the works, been in the works for some time, and uh, you'll get to hear a sample of it. Um, uh, It's a tune that uh, uh, we have been working on uh, of an album, and uh, when I saw that, I was like, you know what, that would be a perfect thing to share during a break, because once we dive into the information tonight, we have. We're not going to take this anymore. We're not. We're done. You know, they they have been playing their games and doing everything that they've tried to do to bring us down, and and it's time to draw the line. So our faith is going to be tested. We have to put our faith to a test. In 1 Peter 4.12, it says, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. We've already told you how God beats down to powder the broken vase, puts water on it to turn it back into clay, and then he puts it back on the wheel to mold it into that what he wants. I believe this is our moment of being beat to powder. The revival will be the holy water, the living water of Christ coming back into this nation to remold it so then we can mold this nation into the spiritual vase that it needs to be to to maintain but life would be strange if we did not have some fiery trials to test us would it not so how could there be courage if there were no danger or tenderness if there were no pain or sympathy and compassion if there were no hardship so how could there be hope if there were no hours of doubt and it's hard climbing that makes the mountain and the mountaineer strong. So in a furnace, the dross burns away, but the gold endures. So when the tidal wave beats on the coastal cliffs, the shale and the slime, they can't take it, and it, it dissolves in defeat. But the granite rock stands undaunted and unyielding. And on the threshing floor, the chafe goes with the wind, but the wheat abides to become seed to the sower and bread to the eater. The Christians to whom Peter was writing the letter from which the above text was taken, he faced trials which we will never see. If we read Hebrews, the 11th chapter, they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, and they were tempted, they were slain with the sword. And they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. And undoubtedly, some couldn't take it, and their faith failed. Their courage dissolved, and they failed to be numbered with the victors. Now, others endured, and and seeing him who is invisible, they were tried as in a fiery furnace, and came out gold, and the tidal wave of of cruel lashing left them unshaken, and they were wheat rather than chafe. So what others have done, we know that we can do, folks. Now, it's been many years ago, but I covered the similarities that the children of Israel went through under Pharaoh that we are going through now, and the pattern is just unbelievably equal. And it has been a long time since I have done that show, and I'm going to rehash it. Now that some time has passed, and we're going to really see how this similarity has has come to pass. And we're going to start in Exodus 1, 8, when the children of Israel were in captivity and under bondage in Egypt. Their exodus, okay? We're going to show the stages of the children of Israel versus the stages of us that we're going through today. 
But it started out in verse 8 where Pharaoh oppresses Israel. Now, you may say to yourself, okay, you know, yeah, I, we can see under the, Obi- uh, the Biden administration that we're being oppressed, which we are. But we had a reprieve for a short time with Trump. But what exactly is Biden taking over? Biden is taking over the Obama administration. So it was the Obama administration that began to oppress. You know, we had ultimate freedoms to do what we chose to do. But once Obama got into power, that's when the racial division began. That's when all these useless wars began. And this is when the cracking down on this one group because we're racist or uh, the riots began, which put, you know, it, it forced people to, the oppression began, well, it, it's been going on for some time, but it, it really took notice and, and uh, took on strength in 2008. So in verse 8 of Exodus 1, now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. He knew not Joseph. Now, <clears throat> tonight, you know, we've been in the New Testament, so we have been going into the Greek translations. Now, tonight in the Old Testament, we're going to have to look at the Hebrew translations. And Pharaoh didn't know Joseph. He wasn't of that lineage. He was not the he was not part of this this Jewish idea that God had set forth in his plan. He rejected all of that. He rejected Joseph. He did not have God within him. And it was, interestingly enough, uh, you can go and research during Obama's first campaign in 2007-2008. The Jewish rabbis in the synagogues of Israel and the synagogues of America, and I'm sure in Europe and other places, they were preaching this story of Exodus, of Egypt, of Pharaoh, of the children of Israel, and they were warning America. They were warning America to not vote for Obama because they said Obama did not know Joseph. Obama was not of God. Obama did not like the Jews. Now, we can see through his eight years of presidency, the way he treated Israel, the way he treated the Jews, that was a a truthful statement that these rabbis were putting out before his presidency. So we see a similarity here between Pharaoh and In Obama, 2008. And what did Obama bring to us? The beginning, or racism was pretty much out the door until he came abroad and then brought it back, started rekindling the flames of racism, caused situations to where there would have to be racism, and then pointed out certain things that there was no racism at all, but but made it into racism, which began to oppress the people, isolate, individualize. And in verse 9, and in, he said unto the people, Behold, the people, the, the children of Israel, are more and mightier than we are. See, when the deep state wanted to take over the United States, they understood that. We as a people are a mighty army, and we are an armed mighty army. And it was under Obama and under that administration they began to start whittling away at the Second Amendment. They are still ripping the Second Amendment because they have got to get rid of the firearms before they can take us down. That's first and foremost, because we have a method of defending ourselves. That's why... And I quote him all the time, but you remember the the burning of the books, the censorship, and part of the COVID, where they would not allow us to meet in bars. They wouldn't let us allow allow us to meet in restaurants. We couldn't meet at church. 
I mean, we could go to these big places, these corporate places, and and spend our money to the corporate gods, but individually we couldn't meet at these small places. Why was that? Because you know how the revolutionaries of 1776 got their battle plans figured out? They would all meet in the pubs. They would all meet at gatherings, family outings, and they would devise their plan on how they were going to fight up and defeat this tyrannical government that was coming against them. So they isolate us. They won't let us meet. They won't let us conjure. And when we try to do it on the Internet, then they censor our speech. They tear down our statues. They remove past historical references. They remove literature and writings. They pull it down under the guise of racism. Why do they do that? Again, Nikolai Maki Iveli. He was a 16th century prince, a tyrannical prince who wrote a book called The Prince in the 16th century, which was nothing more than a roadmap to a tyrannical government and how a tyrannical government can overcome. And one quote that he had that just stands out, I love to share all the time, Machiavelli quoted in his book The Prince, 16th century. And he who becomes master of a city accustomed to freedom and does not destroy it may expect to be destroyed by it. For in rebellion, it has always the watchword of liberty and its ancient privileges as a rallying point, which neither time nor benefit will ever cause it to forget. So if they remove all evidence that at one time a people had the power to rise up and defeat a tyrannical institution, if they can remove that, if they can remove that rallying point, we have nowhere to run to as proof that we can stand up against this enemy. They will be able to defeat us. And the one action that they actually did under COVID, would close the church. Not only could we not meet in our pubs and devise our plan to defeat this globalist enemy, they kept you from church where you could not call upon God. Now, I, I know, I know, I know y'all say, well, a church is not your relationship with God. You can still have a relationship with God outside of church. Very true. But I was driving this week in North Carolina. And I passed a little country church, and on the marquee it said, If you have missed church, then you're not going to mind missing church. If you have missed church, then you're not going to mind missing church. Meaning, if you have allowed this demon, this demonic act, to pull you from church and you get accustomed to not going to church, then gradually you're just going to not have a problem with missing it. And so in verse 9, he said unto the people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we are. Verse 10, Come on, let's deal wisely with them. The Pharaoh is saying, Come on now, this is how we're going to begin our oppression upon them. We need to deal with them wisely, lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. And therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities. So Pharaoh began to put burdens upon them, taxation. When the, in the Hebrew here, we have treasure cities, okay, treasure being miskinah. Miskinah is the Hebrew word for treasure, which is a transposition from a magazine or a store, okay? And if we, if we look a little deeper <clears throat> into that, uh, we can find the word, the root word, 
kanos, which is a primitive root to collect, hence to enfold together, to heap up, to wrap up for one's self. So this treasure here, they had to rebuild the treasure cities. The children of Israel did. Okay, they had to enfold, they had to gather up and heap up for Pharaoh. All of this that they did, the hard work and the taxation, all of it went to Pharaoh. What happened under Obama with the gas prices and uh, raising the price of this and the raising the price of that? All of that money just went into their pockets. We rebuilt the treasure cities under the Obama administration, but check this out. But the more they afflicted them, the more the multitude, they, uh, the, excuse me, <laughs> the more the Pharaoh afflicted them, then the more the, they multiplied and they grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. So we still were not falling for their, their, their shenanigans under the Obama administration. And even in his, into his second administration, that's when they tightened the news harder because, man, we were so used to freedom that we weren't going to give in to any of this. We're not giving in to gun control. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. Rigor. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. What is rigor? Well, King James translates rigor from the word parek for an unused root meaning to break apart, to fracture. That is severity, cruelty, to break apart or to fracture. Listen, and the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with being fractured, being broken apart. What happened under the Obama administration with all these riots and these school shootings and the division that came out of all of that, the division that they caused under racism? Did they not separate us apart as individuals purposely? They set out to do this, folks, just like Pharaoh did with the, with the Egyptians. Rigor. And they made their lives bitter with Hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field, all their service, wherein they made them serve with rigor. Again, they, they well, under the Obama administration in the, in, the, in the trucking industry, you hear me talk about the CSA 2010. It is a new safety record that follows each individual driver. Every little thing that you do goes on this CSA 2010 record, and you get points for it. It's like your driving record and your license. You know, you get so many points, you lose your license. Well, under this CSA 2010 safety record, it doesn't go on your MVR, on your license. It stays on this CSA 2010 but your CSA 2010 as an individual driver is available to any company, any shipper, any receiver. They can just look you up online. And as an individual driver, they can see how many altercations that you have had. Whether you have scratched a truck in the parking lot, it goes on there. And you get points for that. Any type of logbook violation, any little thing that you do, it gets put on record for everyone to see and you being someone who wants to ship your product with a company can go to that company and look at their safety record and then they can just look at any individual record that they want to of a driver of that company to see what their record is do you see what i'm saying so it and if you get enough points on your csa 2010 then the insurance company of that company will say, we don't want you working for us anymore. You're a liability. You're a liability. I, I was backing under a trailer this week. It was dark. I couldn't see anything. And I thought, because I'm human, that I was perfectly lined up with the kingpin. And I, I was, but I, and it was my fault. I should have got out and looked. But somebody that dropped the trailer before me had rolled the dollies down too far. 
and the fifth wheel <clears throat> went under the kingpin instead of hooking it. And as my truck came back, the corner of the trailer just lightly bumped the fiberglass on my on my uh, wind fairing on the driver's side. Just enough pressure to kind of break the fiberglass away from the screws, which had no way to hold on now, so I couldn't drive the truck because that piece of fairing would fly off in the wind. So I had to to go, take it back, and say, hey, man, I boogered the truck. I'll need a spare truck while that one's being fixed. Well, guess what? It goes on my CSA 2010 as an accident. Do you see the oppression? Do you do you see, and, and, and under the CSA 2010, just that little incident carries the same amount of points as if there was a, 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 a car crash and the, and the vehicle was totaled. You see what I'm saying? This was under Obama. He passed this, okay? And this is what it said. And he made their lives bitter with hard bondage and in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. And all their service wherein they they made them serve with rigor. This is where we are today. They keep tightening the noose on us. And verse 15, And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives of their names of the one, uh, Sapphira, and the name of the others. And and it goes on talking about that. But I, I just wanted to open with this and let you know that right out of the gate, Okay, I'll quickly paraphrase uh, this. I don't want to drag this out, but I I wanted to show you in the intro here how we're going through the same similarities as the children of Israel. We began to be oppressed. We, just like the children of Israel, when the children of Israel had to rebuild the treasure cities, they got hounded and oppressed with, with taxes, and they had to pay twice as more and work twice as hard, and all of that money went into the kingdom's pocket. And then the kingdom began to start growing from all of this. And then Pharaoh, as time went on, and it came time for the children of Israel to be rescued, to be exited out of Egypt, the plagues began to come. And when the plagues began to come, what did Pharaoh say? Oh, people, don't y'all worry about nothing. We have gods that will protect us from these plagues. Well, that was the whole purpose of the plague. So God, of the God, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God, <clears throat> could prove that their gods are useless. That's why the plagues came. But Pharaoh said, oh, 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 we can take care of everybody. We have gods for that. Yeah. And under Obama... <clears throat> All these people started screaming health care. You know, the Democrats have all screamed health care. What did Obama say? Ah, don't worry about it. I'm going to take care of everybody. <laughs> I'm going to create Obamacare. We're going to take care of everybody. Yeah. You see a similarity here? Starting to see it fall into place. Ecclesiastes 1.9, what has been done will be done again. And what has happened will happen again. There is nothing new under the sun. Oh, I've got Obamacare. And what were the Jewish rabbis doing in Egypt back in the day when the plagues hit? Because Pharaoh was like, oh, man, listen to me. And they were saying, no, don't listen to Pharaoh. It's the blood of the lamb. You have to sacrifice the lamb to God and, and pray to God that he deliver us from these plagues. That's what the Jewish rabbis were saying. And what were the preachers saying back under Obama during all of this travesty when disease was up on the uprise and all these things were happening and we had Obamacare coming on the scene that we were going to have to pay for? Oh, and by the way, if you don't take it, you have to pay a penalty. Yeah, more enslaving. And our preachers back then still had a little salt left in the shaker, and they said, no, it's the blood of Christ that we need that's going to deliver us from this oppression just like the children of Egypt. And then, all that money and all of that taxation, the money began to become worthless. 
So the kingdom got together back there and like, man, we need to we need to come, we need to devise a plan here. I'm paraphrasing. We need to devise a plan here on how uh, because the people don't really know the money's worthless, but we need their precious metals. How are we going to get their precious metals? Oh, I have an idea. They don't know the money is worthless. We will pay them top dollar for their gold and silver. And they'll just give us their gold because they'll be getting all this money, even though it's worthless. The Bible says they threw their gold in the streets, folks. They just threw it in the streets to give it to the kingdom because they wanted that money that they didn't know was worthless. And under Obama, what did we see pop up on all street corners around the United States? You know what I'm talking about? Those little stores back in the day under Obama, remember, we'll buy gold, we buy gold. And you had them people standing out on the street corner with them signs, and they was flipping those signs around and doing all kind of dances with those signs, these arrow signs pointing, you know, we buy gold, pay top dollar for gold. And they were popping up everywhere. And we were throwing our gold into the streets and selling all of our gold for top dollar, not knowing that the money that we were getting was hyperinflated. It was just printed out of nowhere. It had no standing and it was worthless. We threw our gold out in the street. Then, then Trump comes along. Then Trump comes along. What happened in Egypt? The government of Egypt, once they got all of their gold, then the government kind of started coming unwound in Egypt, started going haywire. And when Trump got into office, our government went into a tailspin, man. I mean, it's, you know, Trump was making America great again. I'm talking about the wicked pharaohs in our government. They were going into a tailspin, folks. And the government began to start coming unraveled, man. They were pulling lies and openly doing things that they used to do in darkness and in secret. And then Trump's administration passed, and here we are now at Biden's administration. And the government is in flames, and it's going to hell in a handbasket as we speak. Just like was happening in Egypt. And then the last plague came, the death of the firstborn, where the death angel passed over and you had to put blood over your doorframe. I say tonight, we need to put the blood of Christ around our doorframe, folks. I, I was going to say that we were already in the wilderness, headed to our promised land, but I don't think we're there yet. I think the death angel is swarming about this nation and other nations alike because we have people everywhere rising up now, standing up against this tyranny. And in the U.K., man, they're having rallies. No more of this draconian action against COVID. They're done. They're done. And I was going to say that we have now exited Egypt and are in the wilderness, wandering around in the wilderness. I don't think we're quite there yet because before they went into the wilderness, God took the riches from the wicked and gave to his people, then sent them toward the promised land. We, I haven't seen a, a, well, okay, let's just say maybe if what Trump did in his four years to build the economy back up and, and create more jobs, maybe that was a little bit of wealth coming to us. Maybe we are stepping out into the wilderness now. Either way, we have to walk in faith. We have to trust in faith. This is a trust of faith. But nonetheless, whether we have already stepped off into the wilderness or whether we are about to go, folks, we can see that we have been following the exact same pattern as the children of Israel. And we must learn from the children of Israel. They had a problem walking in faith. And we saw what happened to them because of that. Folks, do you understand that when they got to the Red Sea, when there was no other way, God parted that Red Sea. When they were hungry, he fed them. When they were thirsty, he gave them drink. And for 40 years, they wandered in the desert, and their shoes never wore out.
when we get back from our break, we're going to jump into all of the shenanigans that's going on this week that's really going to open your eyes to a lot of things. And so during this break, like I had told you, we uh, I've got a little surprise. I was coming upon a, uh, a song that... Uh, some guys that I grew up with as a kid, uh, we always played music together. And when I moved back to Nashville a few years ago, we uh, we got together and started writing songs. And, uh, of course, I have a recording studio, so we began to start recording what we uh, had written. And uh, we're working on an album right now. Of course, it's blues. Uh, but when I stumbled across this one demo off the new album, so y'all get a treat. You get to hear a demo off the new album, okay? I didn't write this one. It was Dave and Chris that wrote this one. I think I'm playing a little guitar in this one. I am playing the harmonica, but we recorded it here at the studio. It's called Just Saying, and I think the words of this is very important because I believe that we're all here. We're not going to take it anymore. It's time to turn to God. We'll be right back right after this. Smokehouse. To talk with Smokehouse, dial 712-770-3857. That number once again is 712-770-3857. Then dial the access code 252-380, followed by the pound sign, and you will be placed in the queue. Call in and join the show. Smokehousestudios.net God is among us. The door to the ark is slamming shut. you said about me yesterday I don't want to hear your lame excuses that talk is cheap anyway I'm leaving today and it's final just one more thing I need to say tired of the pain and that sorrow jumping in the sun out of the shed I made my mind up, changes on its way. I'm ready for tomorrow. Starting out a day, just saying, you ain't gonna get me down no more. You ain't gonna bring me down. You ain't gonna get me down for sure. Think it's time for you to hit that door. Hit it for the last time. You ain't gonna get me down no more. Well, you're lying and deceiving. You're ready to play another day You had it all on your thoughts, so Now comes that price that you will pay I make my mind up, changes on its way You want the answer, the all I've got to see Just say it, you ain't gonna get me down no more You ain't gonna bring me down You ain't gonna get me down for sure Think it's time for you to hit that door Hit it for the last time You ain't gonna get me down the board You ain't gonna get me down no more. You ain't gonna bring 
me down You ain't gonna get me down for sure You gotta go, so get gone Say the be for sure Get it for the last time You ain't gonna get me down And all I'm gonna say is I'm just saying And that was uh, just saying Ain't gonna get me down no more Folks, this is it We are under the blanket of Christ Period, in a discussion We talked about last week how not one sparrow will fall to the ground outside of the will of the Father. So where we are right now is the will of the Father. And our faith is being tested. Are we going to cower? Are we going to cower under the devil's reign? Are we? Are we going to give in to this? Now, I'm not... I know that we have to obey the laws of the land, but the laws of our land are the Constitution, folks. And anything that is passed outside of the guise of the Constitution, Mulberry versus Madison in the 1800s, the lawsuit Supreme Court ruled in Mulberry versus Madison that the Supreme Court is the supreme law of the land, and anything outside of that is not a justifiable law. But see, we're destroyed due to lack of knowledge. We do not call upon the Lord as we should. Stories of the early 1800, late 1700, early 1800 revivals were up in the East Coast. They had to pass laws because people were climbing trees to hear the sermons when they would gather. And the power of God was so strong that it was blowing people out of trees. So they had to pass a law to keep people from climbing up in the trees. Can you imagine that? We serve the same God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So if the power of God could blow people out of the trees then, why is the power of God unable to just simply turn the page into the songbook in the church today? It's not God's fault. It's our fault. Because we are not calling upon him, eating, living, breathing, and drinking God. We have allowed the gods of this land and of this area to consume us, our attention, our time. And now we find ourselves where we are. We are being tested. We have been beat down to powder now. And I believe that the spiritual water that's going to be sprinkled back onto this powder to turn it back into clay is coming. And then God will then put us back on the potter's wheel and mold us back into what we need to be. So hardship, hard times are coming. It's going to get worse before it gets better. Okay, what is exactly going on here? Folks, in James chapter 1, James shares a lot of stuff with us. But there's three things that uh, I want to look at here. Uh, James 1, chapter 4. Now, let me start with number three. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Okay, so we already know right now, yeah, our faith is being tried right now, man. It's, It's being tried to its extent. But what did James tell us? That... It worketh patience in us. It gives us patience, perseverance to trust upon God. Verse 4, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting for nothing. See, we don't need to be in a, in a position right now to where when God is putting us into the furnace, when the flames are turned up hot, we have got to be content with what we have been given because God is our provider. Now, I'm not saying to stop trying to better yourselves or, or, or produce at work. You know, uh, we're, we're required by God to give 100% of everything we do. But what I'm saying is, is understand this uh, rope that's been tied around our neck, the stifling of our breath. It's because God wants us to breathe his breath, and it does not come 
into our lungs. It comes into our heart. Verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and unbraideth not, and it shall be given him. What's he mean by that? We have to understand that wisdom is a key tool to knowing how to deal with difficult situations and acknowledging the need for wisdom. So James points believers toward God's grace. God's nature is to give generously and without reservation. James, called to live by faith, goes out to everyone. You see what I'm saying here? <laughs> there you go, Pat. Mulberry versus Madison. Just saying. <laughs> That's awesome. Verse 6, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed about. You know, if, we, if we're going to pray to God for something, God, deliver us from this, this tyranny. Deliver us from evil. Show, or at least show me where we are. We have to do this without wavering. We can't, we can't pray for it. The Bible says pray for it. Believe it has been given and it shall be received. D don't pray for something and then waver and then wobble and be like, oh, God's not going to answer that. Man, that was too, that was too strong. That was too strong. I, he's not going to tell me that. I asked too much. Don't be like that. Put it to God and expect an answer and live as though you'll get one. You may not get one right then, but you'll get one. It may not be the answer you want. <laughs> you have to be prepared for that too, but. For let not that man think that he shall receive and uh, receive anything of the Lord. Verse eight. Listen close. This is where we're going to start. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. That's the word of the Lord, folks. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. What The leadership that we're under, we were told we were going to get $2,000. We didn't. We, told, we were told that uh, they're not going to open the borders and let people in. We were told all of these things under this new administration, and guess what? Didn't happen. We were lied to, as usual. Now, I'm not paying homage to Trump, but when Trump told you something, he, he did it. But this administration is double-minded in all of its ways. And we can see Biden, this he trip going up the stairs to Air Force One two or three different times. But we were told at the border, oh, you know, we're not, we're not going to open the border. Well, not only did they open the border, they're allowing COVID positive uh, immigrants to come across that border. Did you know? Did you know that the Democrats are wanting to vote on a bill to stop COVID testing at the border? Did you know that? Research it. Look it up. Yes, they are. You can't go to church. You have to close your school. You have to wear a mask. You have to be oppressed. But the immigrants coming across the border, they're going to stop COVID testing altogether at some point. And COVID positive immigrants are going to be spread all throughout the entire nation. Yeah. Oh, and guess what? Their transportation. You have, when you go to the airport, you have to carry your license. You have to prove who you are. You have to show the ID. You have to be scanned with radiation to see what you have on your persons. You have to be felt up by people, the TSA. But did you know these Ill illegal immigrants that they're allowing to come in to the border and travel all throughout the United States? They're, they're merely given a piece of paper saying that they're seeking asylum. They're here. They don't have to prove their name. 
the paper itself don't even have any any federal or legal watermark on it to prove that it's been issued by the government. It's just a piece of paper. You could throw it in a copy machine. And they can travel in, on an airplane anywhere that they want to go. But you, you have to show ID. How does that make you feel? Well, the border crisis is hit the news because Biden did lie to us. A double-minded man is unstable in all their ways. Check this out. Well, let's before we go there, let's start here. So Jen Psaki, circle back girl, okay, she was questioned now about this border crisis. Listen to what she said. The vaccine was given. Were there expectations set with the Mexicans that they helped deal with the situation on the border? The, we, there have been there have there have been expectations set outside of uh, unrelated to uh, any vaccine doses or requests for them that they would be partners in dealing with the crisis on the border, uh, and there have been uh, requests unrelated that uh, uh, they for doses of these vaccines. Um, every relationship has multiple layers of conversations that are happening at the same. Time. Well, later in the briefing, Saki responded to a follow-up question from uh, re- from Real Clear Politics, Philip Wegman, that her use of crisis did not represent a shift in administration policy. Listen. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, a couple quick questions. When you were talking a moment ago about diplomatic negotiations between the United States and Mexico, um, you said crisis on the border. Is, is Was that a... Uh, Challenges issue? on the border. Okay. But so that's not, that doesn't reflect any change in nope. administration's view of things. Nope. Uh, okay. well, well, the press secretary's phrasing marks the first time a senior Biden administration official has referred to the situation as a crisis. Saki's Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas and National Security Council of Border Coordinator Roberto Jacobson have all dodged questions about whether or not there is a crisis in recent press briefings. Of course, there's never a crisis when uh, Democrats are in office. It's just an opportunity to push through radical left-wing agendas. I mean, the truth is, is that you can just watch and see pictures and just understand, yeah, that's a crisis. You can look at statistics and numbers and see that there's a gag order on the border patrol right now not allowed to release specific statistics and go that's covering for a crisis well are they just say well as long as we don't acknowledge it then we don't have to admit it's true and that's the deception of this administration that you have to realize isn't just lightheartedness this is insanity and if you don't call it a crisis then i'd ask that if it's not a crisis what is it insanity a double-minded man is unstable in all of their ways folks this is deception it's deception. Oh, hold on. Y'all hang tight, man. We just hang on just a second. Hang on just a second. Hold on, folks. Hold on. I'll get you back. <laughs> hold on. Hold on. Okay. We should be uh, back here shortly. Hold on. Okay, everybody. There are two participants in the conference. Okay, we should, uh, everybody should be back now. I just saw that. I'm sorry. Don't go anywhere, folks. We're back. <laughs> we just had a foo paw. But anyway, so getting back to the deal, the border crisis. Now, uh, Jim Pasaki was asked something else. Check this out. Interviews some children that were in facilities. The children described sleeping on the floor, being hungry, not being, not seeing the sun for days. How is that acceptable for the Biden administration to keep children in those sorts of conditions, given the fact that she said you, you were an administration that's gonna be more humane than the previous one? Well, these, let me first say this is, um heartbreaking. Uh, It's a very emotional issue for a lot of people, um, and it's very difficult and challenging. And obviously, these TBP facilities are not made for kids. So one of the reasons uh, or a driving reason why uh, the president has pushed to take all of the actions that I outlined earlier when Phil asked the question is because we want to expedite getting these kids out of these TBP facilities as quickly as possible. And that's our goal and our objective, and into shelters as quickly as possible, then into sponsored homes while their cases are being considered and adjudicated. Uh, We are 
trying to work through what was a dismantled and unprepared system because of the the, F, the role of the last administration. It's going to take some time, but we are very clear-eyed about what the problems are and very focused on uh, putting forward solutions. Now, I understand the idea of these facilities not being designed by children, but children being hungry, sleeping on the floor, not being allowed outside for days at a time. Why is that acceptable to go on even for one more day? Why is that something that's not being outlawed right now? How is the administration not stopping that today? Well, Yamisha, it's not acceptable. But I think the challenge here is that there are only there are not that many options. So the options are, and we have a lot of critics, but many of them are not putting forward a lot of solutions. The options here are send the kids back on the journey, send them to unvetted homes, or work to expedite moving them into shelters where they can get uh, health uh, treatment by medical doctors, by, uh, by educational resources, legal counseling, mental health counseling. That's exactly what we're focused on doing. And this is an across the administration effort that we are committed from the top to making changes on as quickly as possible. Double minded. This is a test of our faith, folks. You know, under Trump, guess what? It was kids in cages. It was kids in cages, man. And they were given uh, food. They were given shelter. They were given education. They were in nice facilities, but the Democrats were calling them kids in cages. Well, now under the Biden administration, they're no longer called kids in cages. They're uh, detention facilities. And now there's so many flooding the border now under this deception that they don't have the proper food. They don't have proper facilities now. Oh, but but let's not they're not cages. They're detention centers. We're we're going to get them somewhere to where they can have the proper facilities. You you see the deception and you see the lies. You see the devil is in control. The devil is in control. What's the purpose of all of this? This is just my opinion. Okay. This here is just my opinion. And let me give a quick shout out to uh, Miss Jeannie Riccio in New Jersey for listening tonight. Thank you. I, uh, I believe I have spoken to you on the prayer line. I'm not on there very much <laughs> uh, because of my, my work schedule. But uh, uh, I have heard of you, and thank you so much for tuning in tonight. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Robin, for uh, that information. But uh, we're, we're seeing the, um, the deception here. We, we understand it. We know that was what was going to happen after the election. We, we knew that uh, all everything that Trump had done was going to be reversed. And is there a purpose for this? We'll find out. But our faith is being tested now, folks. And in Proverbs... Do not rely upon your own understanding. Trust in the Lord. The Lord's the one that's going to see us through this. But I can guarantee you nothing is going to change if we try to handle this all of our, on our own, our own ways. Nothing. This is, this is where we need to put everything aside and turn solely to God and repent, first of all. Second Chronicles seven seven fourteen, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and repent, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear their prayer from heaven, then I will forgive them of their sin, and then I will heal their land. See, there is a, a process that we have to go through, and we have to do this, because if not, we are going to be staring down the loaded barrel of what we're looking at right now. There's no other option. There's just not. So let me get back to the CSA 2010 for those of you who are drivers and you understand what I'm talking about. We were told when they began to start selling us this CSA 2010 and how great it's going to be and uh, how it's going to revolutionize the trucking industry. Uh, one of the biggest questions we had is, well, are we going to be able to be hired or fired on this? Oh, no, no, no. This is just for us to have a record. It is not going to have anything to do with your employment or your uh, uh, method of being employed. 
and then it was implemented. We were lied to because now the insurance companies have grabbed a hold of this. And if your points are too high, we're not going to insure you so you cannot work for that company. Technically, no. They didn't fire you and they're not hiring you because of your CSA 10. 2010, but the insurance company won't insure you. So if you're not going to be insured, well, then the company can't hire you. So that's how they they manipulate, okay? Same way with this vaccine. Now, I'm not here to argue if the vaccine is the mark of the beast or not. That's not my purpose here. Right now, <clears throat> They're trying to sell, just like they did with the CSA 2010. They're, right now, they're trying to sell, well, now that we have a vaccine, why don't y'all go ahead and take it, and then that way we can give you back your rights. We can let you go to concerts now. We can let you go to church now. Biden said last week, don't you remember, in his little speech, that he said that there's all these vaccines out here, and, and you know what? If you'll take the vaccine, you know, if you'll take the vaccine, then uh, we'll let you uh, gather for the 4th of July. I mean, <laughs> hey, remember? Here, I'll, I'll remind you if you don't. Fourth, in the coming weeks, we will issue further guidance on what you can and cannot do once fully vaccinated to lessen the confusion, to keep people safe, and encourage more people to get vaccinated. And finally, fifth, and maybe most importantly, I promise I will do everything in my power. I will not relent until we beat this virus. But I need you, the American people, I need you. I need every American to do their part. And that's not hyperbole. I need you. I need you to get vaccinated when it's your turn and when you can find an opportunity. And to help your family, your friends, your neighbors get vaccinated as well. Because here's the point. If we do all this, if we do our part, if we do this together, by July the 4th, there's a good chance you, your families and friends, We'll be able to get together in your backyard or in your neighborhood and have a cookout and a barbecue and celebrate Independence Day. That doesn't mean large events with lots of people together, but it does mean small groups will be able to get together. After this long, hard year, that will make this Independence Day something truly special. Where we not only mark our independence as a nation, well, we begin to mark our independence from this virus. Okay, so if you'll take the vaccine, he might let you gather with your family. He might. Now, let me remind you, in 1776, there was a document that was signed stating that we have the right to travel freely on every square inch of property in these United States, uninhibited. We don't have to be asked for papers. But yet, if you don't take the vaccine, well, they're not going to let you meet in various areas. And if you, if you take it and you do what we say, we might let you meet with your family. <laughs> you don't think they're going to force the vaccine on us at some time, folks? I'd like to thank LT for putting this out there because I would have never have known it because I don't look at CNN. Listen to what the CNN reporter said today. Main concern. Is well, I mean, not today, this week. I'm sorry. Main concern is that we're not going to reach herd immunity because of vaccine hesitancy. And I know that's hard for a lot of people to believe who desperately want the vaccine right now. And they're thinking, oh, well, it's just a small percentage of people who are actually anti-vaxxers. And that's true. There is the anti-science, anti-vaxxer contingent. But I think that there are many more people, millions of people who, for whatever reason, have concerns about the vaccine, who just don't know what's in it for them. And we need to make it clear to them that the vaccine is the ticket back to 
to pre-pandemic life. And the window to do that is really narrowing. I mean, you were mentioning, Chris, about how all these states are reopening. They're reopening at 100 percent. And we have a very narrow window to tie reopening policy to vaccination status, because otherwise, if everything is reopened, then what's the carrot going to be? How are we going to incentivize people to actually get the vaccine? So that's why I think the CDC and the Biden administration needs to come out a lot bolder and say, if you are vaccinated, you can do all these things. Here are all these freedoms that you have, because otherwise people are going to go out and enjoy these freedoms anyway. And I fear a situation of coming into the fall where we never reach herd immunity. And then we get hit by the next surge of, of, of COVID-19 in the fall, something that we could have prevented if we just got people vaccinated now. So they're going to dangle a carrot in front of us to give us our rights back if we take the vaccine. Do you see how they're selling it? Now, again, whether or not the vaccine is the mark of the beast is not the issue here. What the issue is here is once the mark does come on the scene, if they could condition you now to give up your rights, which they've done, look at all the people wearing the masks and closing the church. Uh, if you can convince people to do that and then take a shot, look at how easy it's going to be for them to later implement the mark of the beast. The guilt tripping, the taking away of your rights. And we're allowing them to do it because Hebrew, uh, Hosea 4, verse 6 says that we are destroyed due to lack of knowledge. We don't understand, you know, of course it's the knowledge of God, but I also believe that we don't understand the power of God because we've never called upon it. We never called upon it. You know, I've I've got a lot of clips here to play, but uh, i got to share a story with you folks. It was from Brother David Gibb. David Gibb, he's a preacher, he's a trucker. Uh, minister. Uh, he's a lawyer. He's a, uh, 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 you know, he, he goes after the legalities of those that had their religious liberty stomped on. But a lot of, he puts out these uh, sermons for truck drivers on CDs. And, and he was sharing the story of in uh, 1925 when the diphtheria outbreak hit Nome, Alaska. And um, I love this story because, and I'll try to quickly get through it. But um, there was a diphtheria outbreak in Nome, Alaska. And that one winter was the worst winter that they had ever had in Alaska's history to that point and then in Alaska's history after that point. Even till today, they've never had a harsh winter as they had in 1925. And the diphtheria outbreak had broke out in Nome and they were running out of serum. Now, when uh, Alaska would get, what, 20 to 30 feet of snow. They got like 40 to 60 feet of snow that winter. Uh, When the temperatures were 20 and 30 below on normal, it was like uh, 50 and 80 below that one winter. And they were all snowed in. The planes couldn't fly. Trains couldn't go. Now, they had plenty of serum in Anchorage, Alaska, but they had no way of getting it to Nome. Strangely enough, the telegraph wires were still up, and they were tapping out Morse code on the on the uh, telegraph wires to pray for Nome that were dying. Word came to Coolidge there in D.C., and he put out a national day of prayer for Nome, Alaska. And it even hit England, and the leaders of England put out a day of prayer for Nome, Alaska. And then there was a fella, I believe his name was Charlie McCoy. And he was one of the top dog sled runners of the day. He called all of the dog sledders between here and Nome. And he said, I've got this crazy idea. He said, how about uh, we load up the serum here in Anchorage and then we'll, uh, uh, we'll jockey a dog sled to the next depot and hand it off. And then that dog sled take it to the next depot and hand it off. And if we could do that. Could we possibly get the serum, you know, to know? So they loaded up the dog sled in Anchorage, Alaska, and off they go. 
And when asked why they decided, and interestingly enough, all of these men of the dog slew, they weren't very spiritual people, but they knew one thing because they had witnessed it, that when people pray, things happen. And although they weren't very spiritual, they had witnessed this miracle that when people pray, things happen, and it was just enough for them to give it a shot. So they roll out, and in four and a half days, they move the serum. Now, it's, it's a thousand miles from Anchorage, Alaska to Nome, but in four and a half days, they move that serum within 67 miles of Nome, Alaska. Pulled into the depot, and there, I believe it was Charlie Olson that was running the sled at that time, and he was handing it off to a man named Gunnar Kasem. And when he pulled in, Gunnar came out, and he said, Gunnar, it's over. It's over. He said, we've got two dogs frozen in harness. Our lead dog has a broke leg, and I don't know anything about uh, dog sledding, but what I do know is is that the lead dog is the most important dog in the sled that must be extensively trained, and if you don't have a trained lead dog out there, you have nothing. And Gunner said, Charlie, it ain't over. He said, people are praying. He said, Charlie, you ain't going to make it. You've got two of the highest peaks left between here and Nome, and we have another storm front moving in. He said, you're not going to make it. Gunner Kasem said, Charlie, swap out the dogs. He said, well, you don't, you don't even have a lead dog. He said, well, I've got one I'm training named Balto. Put him on the lead. He's like, you can't put Balto on the lead. He's not experienced. He's not trained on normal conditions, much less what you're about to face. He said, Charlie, hook him up. So he hooked up the dogs, put Balto out there on the front. Charlie again tried to talk him out, and all he heard Gunner Kasem say was, Balto, hoop! And off they go. About that time when they left, this massive storm front moved in with sleet, freezing rain, blizzard conditions, 60, 70 mile an hour winds. Balto, hoop! And Gunner Kasem disappeared in silence and darkness. Charlie Olson goes in the cabin to warm up, and in a journal, Charlie Olson wrote, that's, that's the bravest man that I've ever known, and I'll never see my friend again. Next morning, that dog sled pulled into the last depot outside of Nome, Alaska. Now, I don't know if word didn't get to that last depot or if they just assumed he wasn't coming, but no one was up. The dogs were not fed, and they were not ready to go. And it takes a long time to get dogs up, to get them fed, to get them tied up. Gunner Kasem knew he didn't have time to do it. Balto hoop. Off he goes. There is a race that is run today. It's called the Iditarod in Alaska. And they run from Anchorage, Alaska to Nome and try to retrace the tracks that these brave men tried to go. Char Gunner Kasem makes it to Nome, Alaska. Now, he had turned over something like two or three times. He had three broke ribs on one side, two broke ribs on the other side. He was so frozen he couldn't even speak. They had to peel him off of the dog sled, but he made it. Word got back to D.C. President had him come out to D.C. and he won the the biggest medal that you could a civilian could win because of his effort. And they made a statue in honor of Balto, the dog. The only the only statue that was ever created for an animal in Central Park now, Balto. And reporters were asking Gunner Kasem why he did it you know what gunner said gunner said because people were praying and when people pray things happen pray for something god size pray for something god size and he said before you could put 
Balto out there because the reporter had asked him, you know, why he decided to do it with a dog that wasn't trained. He says, well, the important thing is before you put Balto out there, you have to have Balto in here, meaning your heart. So before we can expect God to get out there and lead our dog sled, folks, we have to have God in our hearts. We have to have Christ in our hearts. Then they asked him, another reporter asked him, you know, the, 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 you know what, what gave him the drive? And he said that his grandchildren lived in Nome and he had what they needed. Folks, we have what this world needs. We have it. It's in the Word of God. We, we can turn this around tomorrow. We can have our land healed. We've got to pray for something God-sized. We've got to believe that it'll happen. Because, folks, we've seen the witness of what happens when we pray. But before we can expect God to get out there for us, we got to have God inside us to get it done. And this is why we're in the shape that we're in. This is why when we try to get out there on the dog sled, oh, and interestingly enough, let me just add this to the mix. I think they had, what, one, two planes in the whole state at that time, and they had trains. The latest, greatest technology that they had in their time, couldn't do it, man. <laughs> they had to rely on the ancient technology that they've always had. Look at us. I mean, we've got computers, we've got internet, we've got, I mean, I'm talking to people all over the world. It doesn't matter because this Bible, the Word of God that has been here since the beginning of time, is what's going to get us through it. Ancient technology, folks spiritual technology that is above and beyond anything that we could possibly build here on earth. Bible says in, in, God's, uh, in God's dumbest day, he is still smarter than anyone here on earth. His ways are not our ways. So we cannot fathom in our mind how this should go because our ways are not God's ways. God's got the plan. We just have to ask for it. More oppression is coming, folks. Gas prices are $3 a gallon now going up. And now they're going to implement, or they're talking about, implementing now a CO2 tax, a carbon tax upon us so that we can stop global warming. Check this out. Get something done on climate change? Carbon Dividends is the bipartisan climate solution. Endorsed by business leaders, environmentalists, economists, and scientists, Carbon Dividends will cut emissions in half by 2035, protect family budgets, and create good-paying clean energy and manufacturing jobs. It's time to end the gridlock in Washington and start solving problems together. Carbon Dividends is the bipartisan climate solution. The time is right now. Carbon tax to stop climate change. You know why the climate is changing? Because all the signs that God told us to watch for leading into the last days are happening. The devil knows this. The devil knows the Bible better than you do, man. <laughs> he used to be an angel before God kicked him out. So the devil knows what's happening to this earth. And he's going to try to deceive you and lie to you and profit from that to oppress you because he thinks that he has a better way of outwitting God. So a carbon tax is coming, folks. Now, they're, they're warning him, but they're, it's going to happen. I don't know how, what they're going to call it, but you just mark my word, it's going to happen. But getting back, and i like to thank, uh, again, LT for this because he pulled this up, and uh, I didn't know about this gentleman. Uh, but this gentleman's name is Mullis, and uh, if you remember, 
it, just in a nutshell, the way that they did this COVID test is called a PCR test. And I don't know much about it, but my understanding is uh, basically it's kind of like uh, an analogy of tenderizing meat with a, a tenderizing hammer. You know how you smack the steak with the hammer and it'll it'll uh, tenderize it a little bit? Well, if you just keep smashing that steak, it's just going to beat it down to nothing practically and, and, and just fall off the, the fork when you cook it, right? Well... This PCR test, this is what they do when they when they test you, they put it in this machine and they stamp it. And the more they stamp it down, then the more they they can like just beat this this test to a pulp and then they can it'll test positive for anything that they want, okay? And so under the Trump administration, when they tested with the PCR, they would just, I think they would beat it like 24 times and then test it. And then it would test for anything they wanted it, you know, positive for anything as they wanted it to. Well, the minute Biden took the office, he had the CDC stop stamping it 24 times and only stamp it a few times, which then it took away all kinds of false positives. And then covid numbers begin to crash and biden takes credit for it hey look here man <laughs> it's under my administration we're we're handling the covid the numbers are going down cnn takes their little death ticker off of the uh, headlines now because they have a democrat in office you know how it goes well interestingly enough uh there's one gentleman who uh his name is Mullis and he is like a uh, uh he may have been the one who invented the PCR test but he was in an interview he died in 2019 but listen to this interview where he he talked about this and he talked about how Fauci don't know anything about what he's talking about and how he has actually petitioned Fauci to debate him and Fauci wouldn't do it check this out what what is it about humanity that 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 it wants to go to the, all the details and stuff and listen? You know these guys like Fauci get up there and start talking. You know he doesn't know anything really about anything, and I'd say that to his face. Nothing. The man thinks you can take a blood sample and stick it in an electron microscope, and if it's got a virus in there, you'll know it. He doesn't understand electron microscopy, and he doesn't understand medicine. And he, he should not be in a position like he's in. Most of those guys up there on the top are just total administrative people, and they don't know anything about what's going on at the bottom. You know, those guys have got an agenda, which is not what we would like them to have, being that we pay for them to take care of our health in some way. They've got a personal kind of agenda. They make up their own rules as they go. They change them when they want to, and they smugly, like Tony Fauci, does not mind going on television in front of the people that pay his salary and lie directly into the camera. You can't expect the sheep to really respect the best and the brightest. They don't know the difference, really. I mean, I, I like humans. Don't don't get me wrong, but basically, there is a there is a there's a vast the vast majority of them do not possess the the ability to judge who is and who isn't a really good scientist. I mean, that's a problem. That's a main problem actually with science. I'd say in this century because. Science is being judged by people. Funding is being done by people who don't understand it. Okay, who do we trust? Fauci. Fauci doesn't know enough to, you know. If Fauci wants to get on television with somebody who knows a little bit about this stuff and debate him, he could easily do it because he's been asked. I mean, I've had a lot of people, president of the University of South Carolina, ask Fauci if he'd come down there and debate me on the stage in front of the student body because I wanted somebody who was from the other side to come down there and balance my... Because I felt like, well, these guys can listen to me, but I need to have somebody else down here that's going to tell me the other side. But it Fauci was... didn't want to do it. So he's calling out Fauci for the truth of what's really going on. Unfortunately, again, he passed 2019, but you see how we're being deceived, folks. Deception in the last days. The first thing that Christ told us to watch, when the disciples asked him, man, when are these things going to, to come, and what will the signs be? And the first thing that Christ said is, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. And, and this is the very thing that is happening to the populace of the world right now, is ultimate 
deception, and we're here to show it to you so that you can then make your conscience decision on who you will serve. Because remember, you, f- you serve who you fear. You serve who you fear. If you fear God, you will serve him. If you fear man, then you will serve him. You cannot serve two gods. It's only God or the world. It's up to you. It's up to you. Now there's coming a deception again to the church. We know that this LGBTQ, all right, <clears throat> this Equality Act that they're trying to pass, again, uh, if you're unaware of the Equality Act, it gives all of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexuals, LGBTQ, P, X, Y, whatever these letters are, it's giving them ultimate rights and taking your rights away. Your religious liberties now under this Equality Act will no longer be accepted. If this Equality Act passes, you cannot deny anything to these people under your religious right. It will now open you up to lawsuits from these people if you claim your religious. Now, I know, I know the First Amendment says that we have freedom of speech and the government cannot establish a religion or the free practice thereof. I know that we have the right to practice our belief and we don't have to participate in things. But guess what? Those days are coming to a abrupt halt when this Equality Act passes. And they're pushing the narrative. Do not be deceived. Don Lemon, who is a news anchor on CNN, he's gay. He just got engaged to his boyfriend. And listen to the interview that he gave in regards to the spiritual belief against homosexuality. Listen. To pivot, you got engaged to your fiance Tim in 2019, <laughs> and this morning, and you guys are so cute, we learned that the Vatican has said that the Catholic Church won't bless same-sex unions, quote, since God cannot bless sin. They go on to say that this does not imply a judgment on persons, but I want to know, do you think this sends a damaging message, and how do you feel about that, given that obviously you are now engaged and going to get married? Well, I think there are, listen, I respect people's right to believe in whatever they want to believe in their God. But if you believe in something that hurts another person that, or that does not give someone the same rights or freedoms, not necessarily under the Constitution because this is under God, uh, I, I think that that's wrong. And I think that the, the Catholic Church and many other churches really need to reexamine themselves and their teachings because that is not what God is about. God- <laughs> okay, hang on, I'm pausing this for a second. Notice how he just focuses on churches. He doesn't talk about mosques, doesn't talk about synagogues. I mean, you know what they're doing in the Middle East, right? To gay people, they're throwing them off rooftops. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's not Allah judging them. That is those individuals of that faith judging them at the moment. But he would just chooses to focus on, on the church here. Perhaps it's because it's the Pope who made the statement. Let's continue. God is not about hindering people or even judging people. And to put it in the context of race, I find that, uh, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said the most segregated place on earth, uh, time on earth, was 11 a.m. on a Sunday morning. So I think that religion and the pew keeps us from actually, they are barriers from people actually getting to know each other. So I would say to the Pope and the Vatican and all Christians or Catholics or whomever, whatever religion you believe about, you, you happen to belong to out there, go out and meet people and try to understand people and do what the Bible and what, what Jesus actually said if you believe in Jesus, and that is to love your fellow man and judge not lest ye be not judged. So instead of having the pew hinder you, having the church hinder you, instead of being segregated in the church or among yourselves, go out and have a barbecue and meet people and start, um, and, and start breaking bread with people and getting to know them, much as I do at Joy's house, mostly Sonny coming to my house. What is the devil's two most main topics, main main principles here? <clears throat> he wants people to believe that he don't exist, and he wants people to do as they want to. Do, do as they want to. Don't listen to God. Just, just do what you want to do. He, 
He said that we need just to put church aside. We we need to quit worrying about what God wants, and we have to accept what the devil is trying to cram down our throat. Folks, this goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden when the serpent came to Eve and was like, hey, you want to eat of the fruit? Don't worry about what God said, man. You want the knowledge? Eat the fruit, man. Eat the fruit. Well, what happened when they ate the fruit? Yeah. Yeah, you want to talk about bondage and slavery? Yeah. The devil is wanting you to eat the fruit, folks. We're destroyed due to lack of knowledge. You know, they, the devil skews the word. Yeah, God says to love your neighbor as you love yourself. But we know what abominations God has said are abominations. Again, we do love the person. We don't love the sin. But the point here is, is those who have a lack of knowledge of the word of God, all of it, will fall victim to this. It's our responsibility, folks. We are on the dog sled. We have the truth. We have the serum. And when we're going out in this world and the blizzards are hitting us, like these type of interviews, when Satan's deception is blowing sideways, when it is so cold that our our dogs and our sled become frozen in harness, but yet we still must push on, we cannot be discouraged. We cannot be taken off of our route. We have a duty. The world is dying, and we have what they need. These are the things that we have to point out so that we'll be able to show the truth. And if you don't know the truth, you have to go and you have to learn it and research it for yourself. Okay, Radcliffe was interviewed today. I believe, now this is my opinion, okay? Take it, take it to God in prayer and seek his counsel on this. I'm just giving you my opinion. But there's coming a great deception, and I am unsure of what this great deception is going to be. Many people assume it's going to be an alien invasion, which we know will be the fallen angels or Satan and his minions in the last days, okay? But they're trying to sell it to us as, oh, UFOs, alien invasion. And it's interesting how all through the years, all these sightings have happened, and uh, our elected officials have passed it off as, oh, it's, it's, it's fake. It's probably this. It's probably that. Well, now all of a sudden, over the last couple of years, the talk of aliens and UFOs are now starting to surface. But it is true. And now we're going to start declassifying files so that you will know that there have been actual sightings. There are UFOs out there. Do you see how they are gradually, gradually stepping you onto the beaches of this? to lead you to the water, and the same time they're doing this, they are building a narrative. They are saying, yeah, there's life out there. There's nothing to fear. We've got it. We've, taught, we've been in contact with them for a long time. There's nothing to fear. Radcliffe, he was interviewed on this. Check out what he said. Actually, um, is a program that's been in place for a few years in terms of a task force that, that has been uh, there under the National Defense Authorization Act. But as you correctly point out, Maria, there's now a report that will be issued by the, by the Pentagon, uh, by the Secretary of Defense, and the Director of National Intelligence. I actually wanted to get this information out and declassified before I left office, but we weren't able to get it down into an, uh, an unclassified format that we could talk about uh, quickly enough. But, but frankly, there are a lot more sightings than have been made public. Some of those have been declassified. When we talk about sightings, we're talking about objects that have been seen by Navy or Air Force pilots or have been picked up by satellite imagery that, um, uh, frankly, um, engage in actions that are difficult to explain, that um, movements that... Uh, that are hard to replicate, that we don't have the technology for, or traveling at speeds that, you know, exceed the sound barrier without a, a sonic boom. So, in short, 
um, things that we are observing that are difficult to explain. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's actually quite a few of those, and I think that that information is being gathered and will, will be put out um, in a way that the American people can see. We always, when we, when we see these things, Maria, we always look for a, a, a plausible explanation. You know, weather can c cause disturbances, visual disturbances. Sometimes we wonder whether or not our adversaries have technologies um, that are a little bit further down the road than we thought or that we realized. But there are instances where we don't have good explanations for some of the things that we've seen. And, um, you know, when that information becomes declassified, I'll be able to talk a little bit more about that. <laughs> Can you tell us where it was seen? Actually, all over the world. There have been sightings all over the world. And, and when we talk about sightings, the other thing I will tell you is um, it's not just a pilot or just uh, a satellite or some um, uh, intelligence collection. Usually we have multiples picking up these things. And so, uh, you know, again, some of this are just their unexplained phenomenon. Um, and uh, there's actually quite a few more than have been made public. So uh, I think it'll be healthy for uh, as much of this information to get out there as possible um, so that the American people can see. So that the American people can see. Did you hear where he said they've been monitoring this for quite some time and they're working a way now to share it with the American people? Which in parlance means they're building the narrative to deceive you that what these creatures are are going to be good because they see what's going on down here on earth and they've come to help with their extensive knowledge, yada, yada, yada. We get it. We understand. We're Christians. We know what's coming. This is why we need to put on the armor of God. Now, I have said this on past shows, and I know I wear it out, but it's important to know this. What what in this dog sled, they're moving the serum all the way up to Nome, Alaska. What did these gentlemen do consistently? They moved forward. They moved forward. They didn't worry about what was behind them. They focused on what was in front of them. And when God tells us to put on the armor of God, the helmet, the breastplate, the whole armor of God, if you, if you look deep, every part of your body is covered except your back. Why? Because he wants you to keep moving forward in this battle. He wants your front protected. Your back don't need to be protected because God's got our back. He wants us to continually move forward, and this is how we do it. We, we explain to people there is a deception coming that is going to be, <clears throat> again, a double-minded man is unstable in all their ways. They lie to us saying there aren't aliens. Now they're starting to say, well, there is aliens. Double-mindedness. Flip-flop back and forth. Back and forth. All right. Now we're going to move to these gun bills that are going to Congress. The H.R. 127 bill. I'm going to keep you all abreast of all of this every week. The H.R. 127 is the gun bill that basically will ban all every firearm that we have except for single shot uh, shotguns and black powder muskets. In it, they have worded it to where if any firearm has a detachable magazine, it is now going to be illegal. And you'll have 30 days to turn in your firearms or you will be a felon. And you can go to prison for 10 to 15 years and pay a $100,000 to $150,000 fine if you don't give the government your firearms. <clears throat> but you'll be a felon. Now, that bill has been introduced, but uh, it hasn't been voted on yet from the House. However, these other bills, H.R. 8, and the new bill that Dianne Feinstein has created and i don't know its number let me check here uh, real quick i don't know if it's a uh if it's a number yet but uh let's see yeah diane feinstein of california okay let me stop this here technology it's great ain't it but feinstein of california has introduced a bill that would ban 
so-called assault weapons such as AR-15 and high-capacity magazines to prevent domestic terrorism, her office announced on Thursday. House Democrat this week have already passed the two anti-gun bills, H.R. 8 and H.R. 1446, and the bills respectively would ban the private transfer of firearms between friends, neighbors, and would also extend the waiting period for purchasing firearms targeted the so-called Charleston loophole. Feinstein, in a bill co-sponsored by Democrat Representative David Cicilline of Rhode Island, now wants to begin banning weapons with Democrats or calling weapons of war. A media release from the duo introduced the assault weapons ban of 2021, which was described as an updated bill to ban the sale, transfer, manufacture, and importation of military-style assault weapons High-capacity ammunition magazines <clears throat> like were used in the massacre in Dayton, Ohio, blah, 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 blah. The weapons ban of 2021 is 125 pages of proposed regulations targeting the rights of individuals to own sporting weapons such as AR-15 platform rifles. Now, it's not just AR-15, folks. It goes deeper than that. I mean, it's all kind of any, any firearm that'll hold magazines, and whatnot. The bill would be also ban some semi-automatic shotguns <laughs> in general. Regulate assault weapons. You know what? <clears throat> I'm sitting here looking at an ink pen right here. See? One of them ballpoint ink pens. It's just an ink pen. But if I were to grab that ink pen and stab somebody in the eye, that ink pen would then become an assault ink pen, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh my goodness man you see the hypocrisy anyway to ensure the right to keep and bear arms is not unlimited and for other purposes according to the proposed legislation itself the bill contains dozens of pages which are dedicated solely to 205 weapons by name okay <clears throat> the AR-15 is just one of the weapons so there's 204 other weapons that are on this deal it's been 17 years since the original assault weapons ban expired and the plague of gun violence continues to grow in the country now we've told you that the government creates the problem so that they then can come in and bring the solution right and so there was a gentleman down in georgia that um uh, uh, had a mass shooting. There were several people that were shot. Uh, several of them were of Asian descent. And so the media grabbed that ball and ran with it. And they were saying that this is why they didn't want Trump calling coronavirus the China virus, because now it's causing domestic terrorists to start going after Asians in retaliation. And this is why now, these gun bans that they are proposing are so important and need to be passed. See how it works? And both of these, H.R. 8 and H.R. 1446, have passed the House, going to the Senate, and we do not have control over the Senate, so I'm sure that they will pass the Senate. And even if it's a tie, we have anti-gun, anti-American Kamala Harris be the tiebreaker again let me remind you we were destroyed due to lack of knowledge kamala harris let me remind you of the ancient hindu goddess kamala tamika she was the goddess of destruction she was the goddess of tearing down and rebuilding what does kamala want to do she wants to tear down the police force and rebuild it into a citizen's police force she wants to tear down the Second Amendment and rebuild it into what they want the Firearms Amendment to be. Nothing new under the sun, folks. We're dealing with the same demonic spirit. It just changes the names of things and tries to polish it to make it appear to be a lot sweeter to the taste, but it's still going to be bitter to the stomach. So Schumer comes out in praise today over, or this week, over the uh, 
H.R. 8 bill passing the House and going to the Senate. And, and listen to what he said. Now that we're going to have this bill, now that we're going to ban your weapons, America, we no longer need thoughts and prayers when these things happen. Yeah. Further pushing God out of the focus here, of course. Listen to what he said. Ground check. It is desperately needed. And the House, of course, has had the good sense to pass this three times? Twice. Twice. Twice after today. <laughs> oh, twice after today. We'll have the good sense to have passed this bill twice. And in the past, when they sent it over to us last time, it went into Mitch McConnell's legislative graveyard. The legislative graveyard is over. H.R. 8 will be on the floor of the Senate, and we will see where everybody stands. No more hopes and prayers, thoughts and prayers. A vote is what we need. A vote, not thoughts and prayers. And we will see where people stand, and maybe we'll get the votes. And if we don't, we'll come together as a caucus and figure out how we're going to get this done, because we have to get it done for the lives of the American people. You don't care about the lives of the American people. You put elderly people in nursing homes so that you can ensure death so you can get your COVID numbers up. You butcher and slaughter babies in the womb so that you can sell their organs and, and, and you can have your little rituals with their blood. No different than they did back in the Valley of Gehenna under Jeremiah's day. Same spirit, same spirit of Pharaoh, the same spirit of the slaughtering of the children. Now they're slaughtering the elderly to get what they want. And now if they can get their little bill to where they can ban the weapons from the American people, we don't even need prayers anymore. Hmm. What do you think, Calvin Coolidge, what, what do you think would have happened to Nome, Alaska? If when the telegraph was sent out there that, hey, we need prayers for Nome, and uh, Calvin Coolidge said, uh, hey, we don't need thoughts and prayers. No. What we'll do, we'll pass a bill stating that you have to have a mandatory amount of serum during the wintertime. Yeah, that'll do it. That'll save the people of Nome, Alaska. I mean, we might lose... Uh, eighty percent of the population this winter, but you know we get the bill passed, and then we just ensure that everybody has the serum. Then next winter we won't have this problem. We won't even need prayer. I mean, that's the same as we're looking at right now, right? What do you What do you think would have happened? But see, we were a more structured, foundational, God-fearing nation back then. We knew we needed prayer. We knew there was only one way to deliver these people from Nome. One way. And that was God. And there's very few people like that left today. They're falling victim to the deception. They are falling victim to cause of lack of knowledge are falling victim to all of this and this is why we're being overtaken we're in the last days the falling away the great falling away is happening right before our very eyes we need to wake up to it and before i get to the good news because <laughs> it's all i know doom and gloom but at the end i, I do get to the good news um hr1 uh, if you're unfamiliar with hr1 basically uh, H.R. 1 is the, the voter bill, and that is to where that they can allow mail-in voting, no ID to vote, illegal aliens can vote, felons in prison can vote. Uh, basically, the Democrats are just going to change the election laws federally so that they can get every single vote that they want. And they can continue to manipulate the elections every time they turn around so that from this point forward, after the 2020 election, they will have ultimate control over the United States from here on out. That's what H.R. 1 is. It is going to shred. You ought to read H.R. 1, all the things that are in it. 
It is going to shred the way that we vote for our elected officials. No more honest elections. Of course, we haven't had honest elections in a long time, but I mean, this is going to to uh, uh, sear the elections with a with a hot iron. Boom! No more total dictatorship, and we are one hundred percent under tyranny. Check this out. Red counties, these are really important things that absolutely influence an election. And Democrats are trying to memorialize it, federalize it with HR1. This is one of the most important pieces of legislation, I think, in the next two years that we'll see. We've got to stand against it because integrity matters. State legislatures should be paving the way for elections, not lawless, uh, undemocratic, unconstitutionally uh, actors like the secretaries of states who are Democrats who are flouting the Constitution. And how ironic. There was a very close race in the state of Iowa. There was a count. There was a recount. The votes were certified. A Republican was seated in that race. Now Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats are saying they might unseat this person. Wow. Sounds like they might be, according to their definition, inciting an insurrection. That's right. And look, Sean, you and I have talked about this often. And what I hope to happen in any election is for the vote of the American people to be accurately counted in that vote, be it Democrat, be it Republican, whatever it may be, to be accurately put forward and to be honored and respected. What Nancy Pelosi is doing is flouting the will of the people, throwing it away. Who she wants should be the person who's there saying, I run elections, I federalize elections, where all I want is for the vote of the American people to be truly and accurately counted. And what they're talking about, if you're unaware, there's a senator, there's there a Democrat and Republican senator in Iowa, and the Republican won. But Pelosi now is going back to try to overturn that election so they can get that Democrat in. But yet at the same time, when Trump merely says, hey, we've got 100 percent proof of election fraud, Mike Lindell is out there putting his reputation on the line. Lynn Wood and Sidney Powell are out there saying, we have got the proof, but we, we can't get a court anywhere to hear it. We have the proof. 100% election fraud. And the Democrats come out and say, well, no, 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 no. You can't overturn an election. Boom. It's You can't do it. Uh, the courts aren't going to hear it. We're not going to allow it. But yet, they, in this Iowa situation have no problem overturning an election after it's over with so that they can get their little Democrat in. You see, you see the hypocrisy here. We, we covered last week when we looked at the Greek translation of Levin, when Christ was feeding the multitude, and then the disciples and him left on a boat, and the disciples were looking around, they're like, man, we didn't bring any food, man. We didn't bring any bread. And Christ is like, what? Why are you worried about food? Look at what we just did over there, man. And Christ warned them. First thing, he warned them about the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And of course, leaven meaning, you know, that which starts up, you know, like the yeast of the bread. It, it, it's what starts the ball rolling. The leaven, but it also means hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. He warned them to be mindful of the hypocrisy of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Folks, that warning is just as good today as it was then. I mean, we're scrounging around in our boat right now. Where's our rights going? What? How come we don't have? How come we're losing our guns? How? How come? Uh, in Christ. Christ told you back then, hey, first thing you need to do is be mindful of the leaven of the Pharisees. Be mindful of what they start up. Be mindful <clears throat> of their hypocrisy. If we would have heeded the word of God, we would have caught this a long time ago, folks, and would have been able to stamp out, you know, basically the devil set a fire many years ago. But it was just lightly kindled. And if we would have had and retained the knowledge that God had given us all throughout the Bible with one foot under the will of God, we could have stamped those flames out, but we didn't. 
because we became complacent. We started turning from God. We started serving other gods like iPhones and Amazon, sports teams and cars and boats. And uh, the more the devil came at us with technology, the further from God that we, we went. But he was having us look over here at his right hand, throwing us all these nice and technolo technological things and they're turning our music into just tawdry, just filth, gradually turning our movies into filth to where it just gradually lessens our ability to say, oh, well, that's okay. That's okay. It gradually lessens our ability to say, no, <laughs> we're not watching that, Phil. It's a frog boiling in the pot. So he had us watching, the devil had us watching his right hand while in the left hand, he was fanning that flame. And now we can sit back and see our nation and the nation over in Europe and other places is on fire now. And instead, <laughs> of going to the main source of where the water is to put this whole fire out. We're running around here fighting with each other. Well, we need to we need to do this and that'll put that fire out. We need to do this and that'll put that fire out. No. Ain't going to do it. Not one sparrow falls to the ground outside of the will of the Father, folks. So everything that we're enduring is God's will. Now, for the good news, Sidney Powell has not gone away. LT shared this information. Again, I would have not have known about it. Check out LT on Rumble. He has a channel called And We Know. And, uh, man, he's good. He's good at what he does. But if y'all remember, back during the uh, election and the recounts and all that, Trump was demanding that, that these states verify the signatures of these mail-in votes, all right? The legislatures in Georgia were going to do it, and actually Governor Kemp was going to do it. Now, keep in mind, all the Democrats are saying, no, no, we, we, you can't verify the signatures. However, the Democrat governor in California, Newsom, when all these two million people have signed the petition for him to be recalled, Governor Newsom comes out and says, hey, we need to have signature verification before anything happens to me. So see, double-minded, unstable in all their ways. They didn't want Trump to verify any of the signatures, but when it comes to themselves being on the, on the hot burner, they want the signatures verified. But anyway, I digress. So, Governor Kemp of Georgia agreed to, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll go ahead. Yeah, you know, all the pressure was being put on him from the legislatures to verify signatures of these mail-in votes during the recount. And the very day that he said he would do this, we remember that bad car crash that happened on Interstate 16. And it was one of, uh, I can't remember her name, but it's the, the lady Republican uh, representative in Washington from Georgia, this young man that was involved in this crash was a campaign worker for her, but he was also Governor Kemp's daughter's boyfriend. Okay? So the, young, the, the day that Governor Kemp agreed to verify the signatures, this wreck happened, and his daughter's boyfriend was killed in the wreck. And then Governor Kemp came out the next day and said, no, we're not going to verify the signatures. Sidney Powell lays this out. Check this out. But I do have knowledge of other people being threatened and uh, horribly intimidated by threats and extortion and even the, the murder of Kelly Leffler's young staffer in Georgia. That was no car accident. He was vaporized 
by whatever the explosion was. Some people who know more about it than I do tell me it had to have been thermite to have triggered a fireball such as happened in that car. And then the Georgia Bureau of Investigation agent who was investigating it uh, was found dead by gunshot wound to the head within a week. I mean, this, there is seri- there are trillions of dollars of global wealth at stake. There are people from both political parties that are implicated in all the crimes here, and there were crimes committed. Destruction of evidence being among them. I, I mean, there are any number of crimes that could have and should have been prosecuted arising from this election for all kinds of fraud. And then there's the international aspect of it, because there's substantial evidence, and I think there'll be more forthcoming, that China and Iran played a large role in uh, flipping votes for Biden and rigging this election. So the information now is starting to come out. Mike Lindell was in an interview this week, and uh, he's the My Pillow guy, and he's going to create a uh, channel himself, uh, because... Uh, the censorship that's happening, the blockage of information, uh, with the devil trying to silence everything. We know the Word of God says everything done in the darkness will be shown in the light. And we want it done on our time. We want it done our way. But see, our ways are not God's ways. God is not a liar. All of this information will come out in due time, but it's going to be under His time. Now, That's why I opened the show the way I did with the oppression under the children of Israel when they were in bondage and captivity. What would possess God? Now, I'm going to get on us, all of us, me included. I'm going to get on us, Christians. What would possess God right now to to pull us out of this bind, this bondage that we're in? What what would possess him to do that? I mean, (laughs) uh, we're still aborting babies. We're still allowing homosexual marriage. The church, uh, you know, as long as everything was okay, you know, man, we gathered at church and we had dinner on the ground. But the first sign of adversity, a virus, a plague that God promised in his word that he would protect us from in Psalms 91, if we hide ourselves under the wing of the shadow of the Almighty, that no plague will come nigh thy dwelling. We had that promise, but when the plague came nigh thy dwelling, what did we do? We got out from under that shadow real quick and closed the church doors, didn't we? Mm Mm-hmm. And I don't want to hear the argument that the same argument holds true. Everywhere you talk to a church leader about this, well, if we would have left the doors open, the the elder people would have still come. Yeah, you know why the elderly people would have still shown up? Because they are walking in faith of God. Because they do not fear these things. Because they know the promises of God. Yeah, they would have still shown up, and God bless them for doing it. They serve as an example, and Cuomo in New York wants to kill them all off. Why? Again, let's go back to Maki Nikolai Maki Avali in what he had stated. And he who becomes master of a city accustomed to freedom and does not destroy it may expect to be destroyed by it. For in rebellion, it's always the watchword of liberty and its ancient privileges as a rallying point, which neither time nor benefits will ever cause it to forget. So, get rid of the statues. Get rid of all of the evidence of a revolutionary war. Let's get rid of all of the proof of a civil war where we rose against tyranny to stamp it out. Now, we're bringing a plague upon the land, which... God said that he would protect us from. So let's get rid of the old people. Let's get rid of the elderly because they're full of godly wisdom and godly belief. You know, we must destroy that so that the younger generation will not have a rallying point to get around to say, hey, man, the elderly people are so committed to the word of God, they're going to go to church. We can't we can't have the youth in America see that. So all of these corporate churches that are under the 501c3, where the government comes and threatens them, we're going to take away your tax-exempt status if you don't do what we say. 
and then they bow to a government system and say, okay, we won't preach this, we won't preach that, we'll close our doors. You serve who you fear. That was the biggest mistake we could have ever... I, that, I think that right there, when God threw us into the flames to test our faith, I think we failed miserably when we shut the doors. Hey, hey, if you want to tell your practitioners, hey, if you want to stay home, we got church online, but these doors are going to be open because we're operating on faith. We're not operating on sight. And now, what have we found out after we gave them a year? After we gave up on God for a year, what did we find out? We found out that this was a manipulated lie. This was a flu, a bad flu. And we found out they were manipulating the tests so they could get the positive numbers up. This has all been proven. So there was no need in closing anything down, much less the church. But we did it. We did it. So, folks, I know I've gone a little over, but I appreciate each and every one of you being here tonight. I hope you've enjoyed the show. This is all that's happened this week. We have been put in the fire to be refined. We are being beat down to powder, just as Jeremiah had gone to the potter's house and watched the the potter repair the pot to beat it down to clay, beat it back down to powder. And then put water in it, turn it back into clay, and then remold it. This is what God is doing. We are in the last days. God does not want any soul to perish. So we are going to be beat down to powder so that the living water can be sprinkled back into us. And if we allow ourselves to be turned back into clay, he will throw us back on the wheel, and then he will mold us into the image and strength that he expects us to be in these last days. Put on the armor of God, folks, because the door to the ark is slamming shut. You know, everybody thought Noah was crazy until it started to rain. And keep in mind, the sun was still shining when Noah entered the ark. (laughs) We need to be in prayer for Sister Elizabeth. Uh, She's having uh, trouble with her eyes. We need to be in prayer for uh, Sister Jamie in England over there as they are rising up and rebuking all the restrictions placed upon them and uh, thank you again miss Jeannie, from joining us from new jersey we are so honored to have you and i uh, hope you enjoyed the program and all y'all else who are listening we uh we just greatly appreciate all of you man so hang in there folks it's going to get worse before it gets better but as long as we walk in faith walk in the footprints of christ he'll guide us through us Till next weekend, bye-bye. Smokehouse. To talk with Smokehouse, dial 712-770-3857. That number once again is 712-770-3857. Then dial the access code 252-380, followed by the pound sign, and you will be placed in the queue. Call in and join the show. SmokehouseStudios.net God is among us. The door to the ark is slamming shut.